Amen. All right, here we go. The year was 1555. How many of you guys remember that year? It was a great year, right, Don? No, okay. Hey, praise God, you just agreed. Uh, the year was 1555, and on this day, listen, the Christian man, this guy, he was sentenced to die. What? And you're asking, well, why? Well, because according to the authorities of his day, this man, listen, he had the audacity to not accept the Pope as the ultimate authority on earth. <gasps> so they burned him at the stake. Now, not much is known about his earlier life, but in 1519, we know that he graduated from Oxford and later actually became a monk. And even though he started out under the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, as he began to read the Bible for himself, and that's what it's really all about, isn't it? Okay, he not only got saved himself, but he was utterly shocked at his fellow colleagues' lack of biblical understanding. Fewer than half could even say the Ten Commandments, and some couldn't even repeat the Lord's Prayer. And so he not only refused to take part any longer in the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, but he became a champion overnight of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith alone in Jesus for the salvation of souls. And so how was this guy rewarded for being a faithful teacher of the truth? That's right. He was first confined to his house, but that wasn't good enough, apparently. Then he was sent to prison, and then he was condemned to die at the stake. Listen to this. After the, he forgave the man who made the fire. Now, that's a Christian. He forgave the man who made the fire. It was lit, but the fire builder had used green wood. And even when it finally caught, the wind blew the flames away from him. So a second fire was lit, but it only burned low, not flaring up as it should have. So a third fire was lit, but even that didn't do much good because of all the wind. And listen, even when this man's mouth was black, his tongue was swollen, his lips continued to move until they shrank to the gums. He's knocked on his breast with his hands until one of his arms fall off. In fact, he was in the fire for 45 minutes suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But listen to this. All was not in vain. It was this man's writings that had a profound influence upon another group of Christians. In fact, so much so did it influence them that they eventually decided, you know what? Forget this. We need to form our own country where we could have true freedom in Jesus Christ. This group of Christians were called the Puritans. And this man's name was John Hooper. Wow. One guy, one guy being used of God, suffered for Jesus for righteousness sake. And eventually was the catalyst that started our once great Christian nation. Isn't that awesome? How many of you guys would say that John Hooper had a pretty cool life as a Christian? You know what I'm saying? And once again, that's the theme. But here's the problem is we all know, hey, even though God's the same God and we're just as much his children as John Hooper was, what's going on today? Most of us Christians in America, we read the Bible in one hand, we take a look at our life in the other, and we're going, man, there is a serious disconnect here. What's going on? It doesn't compute. It's not matching up. How come these people like John Hooper, man, just one guy, he gets to be used of God to do amazing things for him, and here I am fumbling around in the dark. I don't got this life worth living. I, I got life for giving up. You ever been there? Well, folks, once again, this is the crux of our study. This is the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. Okay? This kind of life worth living for is available to every single Christian. Once again, sake of repetition, turn to somebody and say, that means you. Thank you for all three of you for your participation today. Let's move on. And that's why we're going to continue our study. That's right, a life worth living for. And what we're doing is taking a look at the different keys I believe are absolutely pivotal if we're going to have an amazing, fruitful walk for Jesus Christ, just like John Hoover, affecting the course of a whole nation, believe it or not, in the last days. We've already seen the first six times that first key was experiencing God's joy. Why? Because if you notice, we live in a joyless world. And so when you and I just experience something as simple as God's joy, it's a profound witness. Then we saw the last 12 times the second key was also experiencing God's peace. He's not only given us his joy, he's given us his peace. And you talk about a powerful two-bang punch when we're out there sharing the gospel, just walking around doing our Christian thing with Jesus. Man, it's awesome. Our world has no joy. They have no peace. And here we are. We got an oodles of it. Whatever an oodle is, Tom. I guess that's part of a noodle. But let's move on. I digress. Uh, right, 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 but the enemy knows this, right? He knows this. He knows how a profound witness this is. So he tricks us into short-circuiting that joy and that peace and from taking place, and it ruins our witness. And we saw it last two times. The sixth way is by getting us to have a misplaced understanding. And what we saw is the Bible clearly tells us that all we got to do, if you want a joy that's uh, a life that's full of God's, uh, not just joy, but peace, i.e. without worry, what do you do? You seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and you don't have to worry. I didn't say Jesus did. That's great news. But the problem is, it's a Christianese phrase. We don't even know. What, what does it mean, God's kingdom? I'm searching out God's king. What is it? I don't know. And so we began to break it down. What is God's kingdom? And we saw the biblical understanding 
of seeking out God's kingdom every day is that God controls all things. That's what it means. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the master of the universe. God controls all things. And we saw that with the wild animals, the weather, the white expanse of the whole universe, by the way, and even the wicked governments we saw last time. God's in charge not our government. And it also means that God has the ability to do whatever he wants to do when it comes to meeting our needs. There's no need too big for him. He can meet any need he wants, anytime, any place, anyhow. He'll even do it, even if he has to send angels to deliver pizza. If you were here last week, wasn't that awesome? And even threw in some Charmin toilet paper, you know, because that's what the kid prayed for. It was awesome, okay? And the point is, when we seek this out, when we understand this every single day, you don't have to worry. I didn't say Jesus did. Seek first his kingdom. Seek out that truth every day about God. Peace like a river. It's awesome. And it's not just for us. It's a powerful witness to the lost around us. But that's not all. The third thing we need to understand about God's kingdom, okay, if we're going to stop worrying, receive his peace, is not only that, God doesn't just, listen, control all things. He not only has the ability to do all things when it comes to meeting our provision, but listen, he orders all things. Aren't you glad that God sits on the backside of Pluto every single week and he's got this little ticker tape thing and he's waiting to get that email from the angels to figure out what in the world is going on with Dave this week? Praise God, that's not true. God knows everything. And when you get that, whew, there's rest. You got peace. I didn't say that. God did. This is our opening text. 1 John chapter 3. Turn there if you will. 1 John chapter 3. And uh, we're going to see a great, uh, another biblical truth. How do you have your hearts at rest, i.e. at peace? Okay, and you need to get this solidified into your heart, Christian. All of us do, myself included. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 20. Okay, and if you find uh, 2 John, what do you do? Hang it up. Tom, if you find 3 John, what do you do? Hang it up. If you find 4 John, what do you do? Check it, it's not in the Bible. Uh, okay, it's all enough time. First John uh, chapter 3, verse 16 through 20. Let's take a look at what God's holy, holy, holy word says to you and I today. Here's what he says. This is how we know what love is, right? Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and aren't you glad that we don't have to do that either? Oh, I'm sorry. And hello, we're Christians, followers of Christ. So guess what? We ought to lay our lives down for our brothers. In fact, here's your acid test. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need and has no pity on him, pff, what kind of a Christian is that? How can the love of God be in him? Dear children, uh-uh. Let us not love with words or tongue, but with what? Actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at what? At rest in God's presence. Why? Whenever our hearts condemn us. Why? Because God is greater than our hearts and he knows, what's the words there? He knows all things or everything. Okay? And so here we see the amazing truth from the Bible. I didn't say it, God did. God doesn't just know some things. He doesn't know just a few things. He doesn't just know most things. God knows everything. Okay, and just to make sure that we realize that, listen, God not only knows everything, but because he knows everything, that means he also orders everything. And we'll get into this, Lord willing, next week, but he orders everything for our good, even the ones that we don't like. But he knows all things and he orders all things. There's nothing that enters the sphere of our life, Christian, that is not filtered by the providential hand of God. So let's take a look at some of that evidence. This is the big theological term for those who want to further uh, more Christianese. It's called the providence of God. Doesn't that sound manly? Right? But here's what it is. Let's take a look. God not just knows all things. He orders all things. Okay? He's not the author of evil, but he's so powerful he even used evil for good. You learned that one yet? Amen. Okay. Job chapter 12, verse 23 through 24. He, God, makes nations great. Who does it? God does it, and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and disperses them. He deprives their leaders of the earth of their reason. He sends them wandering through a trackless waste. Job 2, 6, the Lord said to who? Satan. Very well then, God said to Satan. He, Job, is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Who's in control there? Who's in control from the get-go? It's God. Satan is not a loose cannon on deck. Yes, he's powerful, but God has him on a leash. He only gets to do what God allows him to do and even in the case of job listen he's not the author of evil god is holy but he'll even use satan for a good purpose that's how powerful god is christian and then you could be at rest okay you need to focus on jesus job 2 he replied job speaking to his wife remember he's going through the, these hard times she's saying curse god and die right he says this you are talking like a foolish woman shall we accept good from god and what not trouble 
In all this, Job did not sin in what he had said. Proverbs 16, 1, to the man uh, belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the what? The reply of the tongue. I tell people this all the time. I'm going for this job, and I don't know if I'm going to get it. Listen, you need to be at rest. If God wants you to have this job, you're going to get it. You can get him there, and you can have the spirit of Elmer Fudd fall upon you and have the worst interview in your life. But if God ordered you to get that job, nothing's going to stop it. Flip it around, though. Also, this is what the Scripture says. I'm not making this up. This is how your hearts can be at rest. You can have the best interview, knock it out, but if God doesn't want you to have that job, you are never, ever going to get it. So be at rest, right? God comes reply of the tongue. Proverbs 16, 9, in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord, what? Determines his steps. Proverbs 16, 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is whose always purpose wins. God's, God's purpose prevails. Proverbs 20, verse, oh, by the way, aren't you glad that many times the things that you have, your plans didn't work out? Aren't you glad that God's purposes prevail? Your heart's at rest. Proverbs 20, 24. A man's steps are directed by the Lord. How then can anyone understand his own way? Proverbs 21, 1 and 30. The king's heart is in the hand of who? The Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. There's no, listen to this, no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Psalm 139, 1 through 4. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Listen, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. Before I even say it, you know what's coming out of my mouth. Oh, Lord. Uh, Lamentations 3, 37 through 38. Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both what? Calamities and good things come? Yeah. But the good news, Christian, for those who love him, God's promised even those calamities, he'll work together for good. It's awesome news, okay? And the Daniel one night. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. God did it, folks. He worked in that man's heart. Daniel 2.21, he, God, changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and he disposes them. And Acts 17.6, from one man, Adam, he, God, made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. Listen to this. And he, God, this is all of human history. God determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. How many guys would say that God's kind of in control? He knows everything. He orders all things, okay? And which is good news for you and I because that tells us there's nothing willy-nilly going on in life. Can I use the phrase? There's no accidents. There's no accidents. God orders all things. And so the logical conclusion is, well, wait a second. Then that must mean we need to dispel this accidental attitude, if you will. Or to phrase it another way, that there's, it's by chance, right? I don't think so. God knows everything. He's ordering stuff. And so here's the point. Until we understand this aspect of God's kingdom, that he doesn't just know all things, he doesn't just order all things, but he controls all things, has the ability to do all things, you put all that together, listen, we are going to be stuck in worry land. How many guys don't like worry land? We always seem to go there, don't we? Let's get out of there. Okay, because here's the problem. This is why this, me personally, outside of eternal security, God's providence, his sovereignty, whew, man, my heart's at rest especially when the calamities do come. I don't have to worry about it because everything's going according to plan. It's just God's plan. It's not my plan. And he loves me and he's going to work it out together for good. What am I worried about? But here's what we do. Until we get this into our hearts, we're going to head to worry. It's one, and here's what we do. It's one thing to go through problems in life, right? It's another thing to make them worse. Have you noticed we have a horrible habit of doing that? We make them worse. And one of the things we do to make them worse is we actually think this. It's by chance. There's no rhyme or reason why I'm going through this thing. It just must have come in with the wind or, or something. It's just, oh, no, I'm going through it. And we pour salt on the wound that already hurts. That's not what the Bible says. God's in control. God knows everything, and he orders all things. And even what we would call a bad thing, he says, you trust me. I'm going to work it over time for something good. Whew, your heart's at rest, Right? Or at peace, okay? Right down to the most intimate details, this truth tells us that everything we go through in life, listen, is filtered by the hand of God. And since God is good and wise and wonderful, that means there must for, therefore, logically be a wise, good, wonderful reason why we're going through everything we go through, right? And I'm telling you, and I want to drill this home, folks, there's no such thing as chance. Get your hearts in, rest. It's all being planned out. 
And it's a good plan because we serve a good and loving God. Everything is okay. And I want to drill that home today. The first thing we need to understand about this providential truth of God is it's not by chance where you work. Did you know that? Did you know that? And the reason why this is so practical is because where typically seems to be some of our biggest ongoing worries. It's from Walmart. No, it's not Walmart, although you could worry if you get there too long and get lost. But no, no, it's your workplace, right? But listen to what the Word of God says. This is absolutely cool. Acts chapter 15, just one verse, man, it's profound. Memorize this, baby. Acts chapter 15, verse 18, listen to this. Known unto God are all his works from how long? From the beginning of of the world and so to me here's the logical conclusion with this Uh, god not only knows all things but he knows everything that would ever happen from the beginning of the world right so to me the logical conclusion is this if god knew listen all the works that he was going to do from the beginning of the world then don't you think he knows where in the world we would work right Of course, it's common sense. Therefore, there's no such thing as a chance thing why we work where we do. There must be a wise, wonderful, godly reason why we do. Now, you get that in your heart, you're at rest, you're at peace. But we don't think that, and here's our problem. Because we think it's by chance. It's just some random occurrence that happened in these lives. That we work, why we work, where we work, our priorities get messed up. And we actually think this, Christian, we think the main reason why we work at that place, yes, that place, is because it's about a paycheck. That's our top priority. And so here's the problem. When that gets uh, there, when something happens with our employer or employees, fellow employees or whatever, and since it's all about money, what do we do? We get upset. We get all mad. We get irate. We, We worry about our workplace. But it's not by chance you work where you do. It has been handpicked by the creator of the universe. Did you know that? He could have had you over here in Timbuktu. He could have had you over there in Boulder City. (laughs) <laughs> why did he put you here in Vegas? Even myself, why? Well, here's the reason, folks. Here's the first wise reason. Hello, it's a mission field. Did you know that? Get your heart at rest, Christian. Get your priorities straight. Of all places, of all reasons, if you work at a place that there are non-Christians there, why in the world do you think God put you there? Hello. This is so obvious, it's not even funny. He puts you there. On, he handpicked you. You're the missionary. You're the Christian there who's supposed to tell them about the love of Jesus so they can become a Christian too. But the problem is that we kind of know that and we feel guilty about that. They probably should, you know, whatever, you know, right? And then what we do, we shoot ourselves in the foot. We go, and we go, we, we say, oh, no, I can't witness. I can't, I'm not like Pastor Billy or, or Bobby, you know, and cracking those crazy jokes. I can't do that. They, my punchlines always fail. No, I, no I, I, I can't preach a big old giant sermon. I don't know a giant theological treaties. What if they ask me about dinosaurs and UFOs? Oh, and we never witness. But folks, sometimes you just got to be creative, right? Maybe you can't give a giant theological treatise, but do something for Jesus. Sometimes it's just thinking outside the box. And you know what? These guys did a pretty good witness for the workplace. Sometimes just singing a song for Jesus. Watch what these Christian construction workers are doing on their job. You tell me if this doesn't glorify God. Let's take a look. One of our co-workers, we overheard him singing, and he was singing a part. So... And Paul, we thought we would call this guy in and help us sing. Would you like to hear three parts this time? Paul, come on in here. This name guy, this guy's name is Paul Bigger, and he's a pastor. He's a pastor. We are contractors and we're singers. <laughs> so we are the singing contractors, and we're going to sing a song for you. It has been requested. How great thou art! Right. Then sings my soul.
Wow. Gosh, it's hard for me to spit this out, but that might even beat a sermon. <laughs> There's different ways to witness, right? Don't you think that would glorify God? Don't you think I'd draw it? That's on the workplace. Yeah, you didn't know how to answer about UFOs and dinosaurs, and I get that. Get equipped. There's no excuse to not get equipped on those issues. There's answers. But sometimes you just got to think outside the box. The point is this. Do something. Because something beats nothing. Because if all you ever do is keep your mouth shut and say nothing at your workplace, guess what's going to happen to, listen, your mission field? Nothing. Do something, whether it's singing, do a sermon, do a track, do something. Now, the second wise reason why God's got you working there is as a training ground. Okay, believe it or not, a training ground. If you wish to study the Bible and you want it to move from your head to your heart, guess what needs to happen? You need some sort, some sort of training ground to, to put it all into practice, right? I mean, isn't mean, that makes sense, right? You're absorbing all this information and, and it's just a bunch of head knowledge, but it's got to be worked into you and pumped into you and, and, and manufactured into your life and become a part of you. And so, man, if only there was some workplace, if there was only some place where we could put it to test, if there was only some place, if we could learn to love like Jesus, if only we could be surrounded by people who, who don't love Jesus to help us develop our spiritual muscles. Hey, did you know that's called your workplace? Do you see the wisdom of God? You're here today. You're on Wednesdays. You're doing your own studies. Where do you think you get to put it into practice? Where do you think you're pumping iron for Jesus? It's at your workplace. Do you see the wisdom of God? That's why he put you there. It is not by chance you work where you work. It's a powerful ministry ordered from the hand of God. Be wise with it and be at rest. The second thing that's not by chance when you see the providence of God, it's not by chance where you live. You know, because we all know there was just some random occurrence why we happened to pick that place, right? No, I don't think so. But you made your plans, but God's purpose prevailed. He put you exactly where he wanted you to be. Watch this verse. This is really cool. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 through 30. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Jesus speaking, by the way. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. How many, guys, how many, how many birds do you think are on the planet? Go, a couple. <laughs> yeah. How about throughout all of human history? At the same time, oh, God knows everything, folks. This is awesome. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, right? Now, I don't want to go too deep in that because we saw that according to the Bible, you don't want to mess with the bald man. Bears are going to come after you. So I'm, I don't want to learn everything the hard way, all right? But I'm not going there again. But seriously, if God knows every hair on your head, this is what the scripture says, not me. If God knows every hair on your head, then don't you think he'd know every place we'd ever live? Hello, that's pretty obvious. Okay? So therefore, what's the logical conclusion? There must be some sort of wise, wonderful, awesome reason why that God has this, yes, at that place. But once again, here's our problem. We don't think biblically. We got a misplaced understanding. We think that uh, it's by chance where we live. Our priorities get all messed up. And we think the main reason why we live, that's right, where we live, is to have that place to relax. Right, a place to relax. And so what happens is when something happens with our home, our apartment, or wherever we're living, uh, or our neighbors, those those neighbors, right? What do we do? We get all upset, right? We start to worry. We get anxious. We create problems on top of our problems. But listen, read the scripture. Be at rest. Are you kidding me? Crown translation. It is not by chance where you live. Be it Vegas, be it Thailand. Why does he have, of all places on the planet, why there? Well, hopefully you start to see a pattern. The first reason why is, hello, it's a mission field. Hello. Let's, let's go beyond the workplace. Where's the other place that we spend the other majority of our time? It's at our home in our neighborhood. So if you live next to non-Christians, guess why God put you there? Just to stare at them and wave and walk like this again, Ken. I don't know why I'm doing it. Right? <laughs> no, he puts you there. He's expanding your mission field. Listen, you know I get to witness 40 hours a week. You get to witness all the time. If you're in a neighborhood full of people who don't know Jesus, why in the world do you think he put you there? To share the love of Jesus with them. It's a mission field. The second reason, hopefully, again, you're seeing the pattern here, is this is a training ground. How many times have you prayed something like this, Christian? Hey, man, I don't want to just be a hearer of the word. Like James says, I want to become a doer of the word, right? Hopefully, at least one of you have prayed that before, right? And so guess, how's that going to happen? 
Well, again, you need some sort of training ground to put it all into place, okay? And, and wouldn't it be great if you could have not just a workplace surrounded by people who don't love Jesus, but if you could have a whole neighborhood of people who don't love Jesus to every single day equip you, encourage you to get you to love like Jesus? God's way more concerned about our spiritual growth than we ever are because he wants us to be a witness, not just a workplace, but even where we live. And once you start seeing the wise reason why God's got you there, yes, that neighborhood, your heart's at rest. Thank you, God. This is awesome. It ceases to become a worry. It becomes a powerful ministry if you do something for Jesus. The third one, this is cool. This, um, now we're getting into nuts and bolts. Okay, the third one about God's providence is it's not by chance. Uh, da, da, pay attention, Bobby. It's not by chance who you marry. <laughs> Isn't that it? Right? We worry about work. We worry about home. What do we do? You don't want to say nothing. You're too chicken, aren't you? That's right. But let's just go to the text, right? It's your marriage, right? Your family. Let's take a look at that. This is uh, uh, Psalm 139, verse 16. But with your own eyes, God, listen, you saw my body being formed. Eat, listen to this. Even before I was born, listen, you, God, had written in your book everything I would do. Isn't that amazing? Before I was even on the board, you had it all mapped out. What are you worried about? So God not only knows all things, but he knows all things we'd ever done before we ever done did it. How's that for good grammar? Okay. <laughs> but here's the logical conclusion. This is why you're <sighs> I'm at rest. I'm at peace. Why? Because if God knows everything we would ever do, then don't you think he knows to whom we'd say, I do too? Right? Of course. So there must be, yes, believe it or not, a wise, here, here comes the word. You can spit it out. Wonderful reason why you married, yes, that person. Right, honey? Praise God, she said yes. Right? Okay? But here's our problem. Because we think it's by chance. Oh, it's just by chance. Some random occurrence, I met that person and we got married. Our priorities get all messed up, and we think that the main reason why we got married is to have that person around to enjoy, right? And so when something happens with our spouse, or listen, or our spouse's family that we don't like, and since it's all about my enjoyment, all right, we get upset, we get anxious, we worry, and we create problems on top of our problems, and it has nothing to do necessarily with, listen, who you married. It has to do with how you're doing marriage, Sometimes we're the biggest source of our own problems. Like this young couple learned. Might you pay attention. Don't do this. There's this young couple, and they finally decided to get married. Him. But as the big day approached, Ron, they were, both of them were very apprehensive. You see, they each had a problem that they had never shared with anyone before, not even each other. Big mistake. So the groom-to-be, Mike, he's overcoming his fear. He decides to go to his father for advice, right? Dad knows everything. So he said, Dad, he says, listen, I am deeply concerned about the success of my marriage. I, I love my fiance very, very much. But Dad, you see, I, I, got, I got very smelly feet. And, and Dad, I am afraid that my future wife will be totally put off by him. And he said, well, listen, son, no problem. Here's, here's what you do. All you got to do is wash your feet as often as possible. Always wear socks, even to bed. So the groom-to-be, he thought, hey, that's a pretty good solution. I think I'll try it. Well, meanwhile, the bride-to-be, overcoming her fear, decided to take her problem up with her mom. And she goes, Mom, she says, man, I got a problem. She says, when I wake up in the morning, my breath is truly awful. And she goes, honey, come on. Everybody's got bad breath in the morning. And she goes, no, Mom, you don't understand. Whew, my morning breath is so bad, man, I'm afraid that my new husband will not want to sleep in the same room with me. And so her mom, mother simply said, well, listen, honey, try this. Okay, uh, in the morning, get straight out of bed, okay, and head for the bathroom and brush your teeth. The key is to not say a word, not a word until you brush your teeth, not a word. So the, the bride-to-be thought this is a pretty good idea, and she decides to put it into place. So the loving couple were finally married in this beautiful ceremony, and not forgetting the advice that each had received, he with his perpetual socks and her with her morning silence, right? They managed quite well until about six months later. See, shortly before dawn, Holly, the husband wakes with his start, and he finds out that, listen, one of his socks had come off. Yeah, so fearful of the consequences, he starts frantically searching around the bed looking for it. But this, of course, woke up his bride, and without thinking, she gasped, what on earth are you doing? And the husband gasped in shock. He says, oh, no, you swallowed my sock. <laughs> Those young whippersnappers. 
we are the source of our problems. We want to say, oh, the reason why we're having these troubles is because of who I am. No, it's how you're doing marriage. Don't do what that couple did. I'm just looking straight ahead. Let's move. All right? We are the source of our problems, okay? But that's what we do. It's all by chance. We're having these troubles. No, no. Sometimes we create our own problems. And then we get into this other aspect, right? We assume that, okay, that was a young couple, right? But when we get older, right, if, if we were meant to be, if it wasn't by chance, right, if we were going to have a successful marriage, then, then we're gonna, it's going to get easy sailing the older you get. Are you kidding me? Right? That's a pipe dream. Because the older you get, listen, you're still going to have problems. What's the scripture say? Proverbs says, listen, man is born for trouble. Surely a sparks fly upward from a fire. It's going to happen, right? And you, you, yeah, granted, maybe you made it through the bad breath sock routine, okay? But you just change it for a different set of problems when you get older, like this guy shares. See what you got to look forward to, young folks. Let's take a look. We got married last Friday. My girl was right there beside me. Our friends were all gone. We were alone, side by side. We were so happily wed when she got ready for bed then. Her teeth and her hair she placed in a chair. Side by side One glass eye so tiny One hearing aid so small Then she took one leg off And placed on the chair by the wall I stood there broken hearted most of my girl had departed. I slept on the chair. There was more of her there. <laughs> By side. Oh, young and old, man, you're going to have challenges in your marriage, right? It's just going to happen. It's just a whole different set of problems. They're going to keep on and coming. But listen, it's not because get rid of this lie. <laughs> Be at rest. It's not because you married the wrong person. It's how you're doing marriage. And it's your attitude as things change in your marriage. Okay? And this is the good news. It's not by chance you married who you did. And it's not just about your own personal enjoyment. Okay? The first wise reason why God's got you there is, hello, it is as a mission field. Okay? As a mission field. Now, before I go any further, let me set the record straight. I'm not saying that a Christian should marry a non-Christian. In fact, the Bible absolutely forbids that. This is not what I mean with this point, mission field. Okay? The scripture is very clear. Christians are not to marry non-Christians because it's like oil and water. It's called unequally yoked. They do not mix. Sooner or later, you are headed for trouble. I don't have time to tell you of the heartbreak of how that happens and what it does to families. That's not what I'm saying. What my point is saying is this. Sometimes two unsaved people can get married, okay? They get married, okay? And then later one of them does get saved. That's what I'm talking about, okay? So what are you, the, the saved spouse, supposed to do with the unsaved spouse? Share the gospel with them. Or if both spouses are saved, okay, but your families are not, including the in-laws, okay, guess what God wants you to do? He wants you to share the gospel with him so the whole family can become Christians too. It's not my chance. Yes, even those in-laws. God wants you to share the gospel with The second one, this is really cool, is as a training ground. Anybody starting to see a pattern? Yeah, training ground, okay? If you want to move from being a carnal Christian to a spiritual Christian, guess what needs to happen? You need some sort of, that's right, Bobby, training ground to put it into practice. And listen, what better place to learn how to deal with the sin nature than to be married to somebody else who also has a sin nature? I mean, isn't that the, the wisdom of God? He puts two people with the sin nature together. Why? Because that person has an incredible knack. They act like a spiritual mirror. See, when you first get married, you think you're pretty cool. Got it all together. I'm a mature Christian, Right? I mean, I'm just, I got, I've, I'm grown so much. There's like, is there anything else left to grow? That's what we do, right? You get married to that person. 
And what does that person do? Excuse me, you need to work on this, you need to work on that, you need to do this and that, right? Right? It's like the one uh, joke the guy says, hey, if the Pope ever got married, he'd find out real fast he's not infallible after all. <laughs> all right? Because that's what happens. You get married, you think you're pretty cool, you got it going, oh, I don't have hardly, I'm so mature. No, you're not. But see, we never admit that. So you know what God did? He brought a person who has a really good knack of bringing out the right things that you need to work on. It's a mirror. And guess what? God picked you for them as well. It's not to create conflict. It's for both of you to grow closer to Jesus Christ and become even greater. So that becomes a training ground. And once you see that, it's not just by chance. Your marriage becomes a powerful ministry. (sighs) Be at rest. Thank you, God. This is awesome. One last thing, and this real quick, and we're going to close. This one, we really need to get through our heads because we worry about our work. We worry about where we live. We worry about our marriage and our families. Listen, Christian, you don't need to do this. It's not by chance when you die. It is not by chance. We were born on time. We're going to die on time. Be at rest, and you're not going to stop it. Okay? I didn't say that. God did. This is awesome. Uh, Job chapter 14 Uh, Verse 5 simply says this. You, God, have decided the length of our lives. Who decided? The doctor? You? God. God has determined the length of our lives. He decided it. You, God, know how many months we will live. Listen, and we are not given a minute longer. We're born on time. We're going to die on time. God not only knows all things, he knows everything about us to the point of the exact day we are going to die unless the rapture occurs first. Why? Because he is the author of life. And since we have a hard time believing this, listen to this, I want to prove it to you. We should listen to the Holy Bible. But I want to prove it to you that, listen, God knows exactly the exact day, the exact time we're going to die. Of course, he's God. But I want to reveal that in a video that I came across of showing how God clearly revealed to a Christian, a Christian man, listen, that he was not only going to die, but he specifically did it just prior to his death so that God would graciously allow him the privilege of making preparations for his family beyond the grave. Absolutely amazing. And listen to the effects of this truth having on the grieving loved ones left behind. Watch this. This is cool. Hello, everybody. Um, if you're watching this, something bad probably happened to me. Um, I had this dream last night that, or this morning, I mean, only a few minutes ago, that I died early, and I don't know what to take of it. So I had all these instructions going through my mind on what I would say, like on my last day of dying. And I don't know if this is God's way of saying record this and it was divinely inspired or if I'm just paranoid paranoid, or what so I wanted to record my thoughts while I had them I could then remember this vague memory of uh, in the middle of the night Eric getting back in bed and I, and I just kind of rolled over and he gave me a hug and so it kind of woke me up and I said where have you been because I realized he was gone and he said oh I was making a video he's like I had this terrible dream that I died it didn't enter my mind at all when he died to go and, oh, I should go look for that video he made. I, I totally forgot about it, so it was a complete surprise when I pulled that out, and we sat down right away to watch it. My family means so much to me. You guys are a close second to God. But you mean a whole lot to me. And I want you all to know that I'm in a really good place right now. I thought my life was going to be a lot longer but it wasn't and this is God's will it's perfect I just I'm crying because I didn't think this would be this hard but it is the gist of the video was to give a lot of um, instruction for what he would like to happen with both myself and the kids if something happened to him uh, it had a, of course a lot of uh, Christian instruction as well in there okay Heather this is tough but I need to tell you that I don't expect you and I don't want you to be single. <sighs> Raising these boys is way too tough. 
your job. If you choose to accept it. No, you don't get to choose. You have to accept this. Is that I need you to re I want you to remarry. And I'm not crying out of jealousy. I'm crying because I'm thinking about being gone from you. <laughs> I love you so much. And at the top of recording this, I don't know if the fifth kid's a boy or girl. But whatever it is, which is probably a boy, they... <coughs> They need a father. And you need to remarry. Probably what sticks with me the most is um, how many times he mentions that I should find somebody and remarry. I, it was, I think it was like seven or eight times. You know, and, and that was so hard to, to hear that because this is, you know, coming from the person, you know, that was the love of my life and, and was taken from me. And to hear him say he wants me to move on and for me to think about moving on was just very hard. Boys, I don't know if I can do this part. Brain, I need you to grow up as the leader of this family. <laughs> Justin, I need you also to grow up as a leader of this family. I need you to take care of your smaller brothers. <sighs> Keep them together. <sighs> I need you to look after mom. But what did you find when she does find a new father? I need you to love him like you love me. God decided it was my time and that's okay. I don't want you guys to hate God because I'm gone. Remember that this is not... Uh, it was just my time. My time was to go. And I'm okay with that because it was God's will. And I need all of you to remember to continue to pray and pray often. Don't pray for me. I'm in a good place. I need you to pray for the people who don't know God. I need you to pray that they may come to know the Lord. <laughs> you know, as far as I know, he kissed them goodnight one night to bed, got up early before they got up, left for work, and never came home. And so that's very hard for, you know, anyone to deal with. And so I think this video has given us closure and it has given us some peace. It gave them knowing that her husband's death was not by chance. And boy, did God demonstrate that in a profound way. Receiving that truth. It didn't just give them closure. She said, I didn't. It gave her and her family Set your heart at rest. God knows all things. God orders all things. Be at rest. That's his kingdom. No wonder Jesus said, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your workplace. Don't worry about where you live. Don't worry about your family, your marriage. Don't worry about when your time comes. You just get busy seeking his kingdom, his righteousness. Lead souls to Jesus and be set free. Not just today, but tomorrow and however many tomorrows he gives you. And go be that profound witness for me in this crazy messed up world and lead as many souls to heaven as well. That's a life worth living for in the last days. Amen? Let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. 
In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief. Okay, the Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how... Uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word. Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. Okay, and folks, let's be honest, we've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you, that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that and it's just as bad. He knows the mind, he knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God, and you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says, we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, 
Nothing that the person did because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it and they can't earn it. If he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that right now? Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and, and Get a Life Ministries. And if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, our number, our information will uh, come up here on the screen shortly. And uh, uh, if there's anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.